It was an attempt in some ways to re-enslave black people. Four decades after emancipation, African Americans struggled to achieve equality. Jim Crow denied black people all forms of social respect. Jim Crow kept the races apart at work. I worked in an all-black section. And at play. That whole amusement park did not wish to allow black people into their park. It lasted, certainly in law, until the 1960s. Was it just an ugly chapter in American history? Or is Jim Crow making a comeback? There is a Jim Crow in the 21st century that wears a suit and tie and carries a tablet. Once a robust slave trading center, today the city of Alexandria honors its black history. You will find statues memorializing the Edmondson sisters who tried to escape slavery. You can stroll through the African American Heritage Park and drop by the Black History Museum. Hi, I'm Robin Hamilton. Here in Alexandria and across the country, in the days following the Civil War, a system of laws and customs called Jim Crow began to be enforced. They kept the races separate, but more importantly, they helped perpetuate negative attitudes towards African Americans for more than a century. Jim Crow impacted blacks and whites. It was a system that also taught whites that they were superior in, in every way that mattered. It taught African Americans that they were inferior. It wasn't just a set of ideas, it was reflected in the objects that we produced. Thousands of everyday objects that remind us of the Jim Crow era crammed the display cases here at Ferris State University. David Pilgrim founded the Jim Crow Museum on the Big Rapids, Michigan campus in 1996. I started when I was a teenager, and I went to a historically black college and also learned that you could use objects of intolerance to teach the lessons of Jim Crow. There are no pieces in here which are not useful as teaching tools. On one wall of the museum, you can find a bigger-than-life sketch of the character Jim Crow. Created by a man named Thomas Rice, he was popularized in minstrel shows as early as the 1830s. Rice's performance of the slave tune, Jump Jim Crow, became an international sensation. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Well, there were people who saw what he did, decided to expand, uh, you know, created troops. And uh, from about the 1830s, almost through to the end of the 1800s, you had professional minstrel shows. And a lot of the caricatures of African Americans, they were popularized there. You know, things like the mammy and the, the coon and the piccaninny, the good old darky kinds of images. At some point, Jim Crow stopped being a name associated with stage mockings of African Americans and became a synonym for the racial hierarchy that existed in our country that had whites at the top and blacks at the bottom. You could make the argument that it lasted certainly in law until the 1960s. Sometimes people, I don't think they get it when they'll think, what does a mammy ceramic cookie jar have to do with Jim Crow? Well, it was a way of placing Jim Crow ideas in your kitchen. They became propaganda, which both shaped and reflected attitudes toward African Americans. Mm -hmm. 
Walking through the museum certainly brings you face to face with some disturbing realities of our racial history. The lynching tree, of course, is a powerful object. And if you know anything about the a lynching period in the United States and you're sane, then you will have an emotional response to that. But it's certainly a high risk strategy for teaching. And given the sort of racial climate in our culture right now, there's a, an even greater potential for, for controversy, but that's not our intention. It, it, actually, our intention is not even to be provocative. It's simply to show the evidence of the Jim Crow system that existed in our country and to show those places where the struggle continues. In a society where many people are afraid to talk about race, we have set out to create a facility where people can have meaningful, productive, sometimes painful conversations about race. When we return, living legends of Alexandria share their memories of life during the days of Jim Crow. In 1983, Alexandria established this museum to preserve its black history. It includes the Robinson Library, built in 1940 after one of America's first sit-ins at the all-white city library. We came here to see what it was like to live in a segregated world and to listen to the voices of Jim Crow. As a kid, you knew there was black places and white places, it was just acceptable because that's what you had always seen. King Street was the shopping maker. I would go down to Murphy's, get a little extra money, go buy some toys. And I knew something was wrong because the bathroom said white only and colored. And it didn't take me long to figure out I wasn't white. So I must go in this other bathroom. And then they had two food counters. One in the front, where black people could stand up and eat, and one in the back, was for white people. Nobody explained why this was going on. I do remember going in um, a small dress store here in Alexandria, not far from where I lived, and I had heard people say, you don't go in there because they don't want us in there. So. A girlfriend and I decided to try it out. We went in and it just, time just stopped. The clerks, everybody just sort of stopped in the middle of space and, and we just stood there and looked at them. Well, we could tell they weren't going to say, may I help you? There was a bus station that you bought your ticket in the drugstore. But one day, there was a little hallway and a little window. That's where we were supposed to buy our ticket. Well, we didn't go to that. And my sister went there, and the little, a little girl, she went in the drugstore. And a patron there said, you in the wrong department. <laughs> so she, she took her money and came home and told my father. separate schools. That meant that if you have all new books in your white school, then I should have all new books in my black school. No. You got the new edition. We got your used one. I went to Catholic school two blocks away from here. It was elementary school. It went from the first grade to the eighth grade. It was all black, and when I it was time for me to go to the eighth grade, they eliminated the eighth grade, and I didn't know where I was going to school the next year. And on the south side of town is St. Mary's Elementary School that went to the eighth grade. So I raised the 
the question, I guess that means we'll all go to eighth grade at St. Mary's. It was an all white school because they all Catholics. We all read the same Bible. That makes sense to me. And I was sent to the priest. And you only went to the priest when you were in trouble. The priest came to the house that afternoon and he told my father that I was raising issues about the white school. And my father was very vocal and he says, why the hell can't he go? And the priest says, I don't know. And he said, I'll be back. And he came back and he said, they said you haven't filled out an application. So he gave me the application, filled it out. A couple of days later, it, the letter came back saying what the tuition was, what the uniforms were. We told everyone else in St. Joseph's, there's no room left. So I was the only black for a whole year. There were small windows in the school door and the other kids would come in, they would peep through the door and they would be like, there he is, there he is. You know? And I guess within two weeks, I, I met a, a good friend of mine and he said, Luma's gonna be my friend. And it all stopped. The, no one, no one sang any songs anymore about two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. Segregation, that was just a way of life. And I don't recall whether I really ever noticed it, but I noticed when it, it was over. Next, on Jim Crow, Freedom Deferred, personal stories of how black Americans finally cracked the shackles of oppression. Inside Alexandria's Black History Museum, hundreds of items remind us of the injustices of the past, so many lives affected by racist laws and institutional policies. And they are so much more than historical facts and figures. They are deeply personal and painful stories of Jim Crow. In its most hideous form, Jim Crow denied black people all forms of social respect. Despite promises to black leaders before his election, Woodrow Wilson did little to advance the cause of racial equality. President Woodrow Wilson oversaw what many historians consider to be uh, the largest flood of racist laws and policies for his particular time period. His administration would set back years of black upward mobility achieved through federal jobs. It is said traditionally that his wife was horrified at seeing black folk and white folk work together in federal buildings. And so that had to stop. Blacks in government struggled against entrenched Wilson policies for nearly 50 years. I found myself being the only person of color most of my career. And when I attempted to go into other fields, the response was, I was always overqualified. And to see the little young white girls come in and get a job up there as an admin assistant, that didn't sit well with me at all. I worked in an all-black section. When Kennedy came in to office, uh, it changed. Those people who were qualified, who had these college degrees, moved up to higher grades. Like millions of more entitled Americans, black soldiers went off to war in 1917. But when they came home, their equality on the battlefield was nowhere to be found. These men had put on the uniform of their country. They were fighting for America's best ideals. They were not going to go quietly into a permanent second-class citizenship. 
There were race riots at the end of the First World War. James Weldon Johnson called the riots the Long Red Summer. And it was the summer of violence, it was the summer of blood. The Red Summer of 1919 would take its toll all across America from April to October, leaving 15 dead in Washington, three in Chicago, and more in heartland cities like Omaha, Nebraska, and Longworth, Texas. And black folks, of course, always resisted. There were marches and protests long before the classic era of the civil rights movement. But it would be another 40 years before the movement would gain momentum. I started having sit-ins before there were sit-ins. Dion Diamond led many protests during the early days of the civil rights movement. He began his life as an activist in high school. At the lunch counters, white only, I would sit down at the counter and all of a sudden, we can't serve you. They would call the manager and I would not get up and then he would call the police. And when I saw the police coming into the place, I would run like the Dickens. He continued sit-ins as a student at Howard University, where he joined the nonviolent action group known as NAG. Over in Arlington, he came face to face with the head of the American Nazi Party, whose headquarters were nearby. I wasn't afraid of him. I was afraid of how those people who encompassed us would react. It's almost like a mob. He just added fuel to the fire, and as a result, he was a positive influence. He was abhorrent, and that brought sympathy to those of us sitting at the counter. We desegregated Northern Virginia within two weeks. Everything opened up, and we just looked at ourselves and said, wow, if we could do that in two weeks, what else is left? Let's cross the river again and get into Maryland. And there's the Glen Echo Amusement Park. That whole amusement park did not wish to allow black people into their park. 1960s summer of protest at Glen Echo ended when the park closed for the season with no change of policy. But when the gates reopened the next year, everyone was welcome, regardless of color. Were it not for the people who lived in a community called Bannockburn, I don't think we would have been successful. Without their support, we could not have accomplished what we did. That same summer, the new D.C. stadium was gearing up for the kickoff of the Washington Redskins season. They were the only all-white team left in the NFL. Owner George Preston Marshall had resisted integration for more than a decade. He simply refused to draft any black players. Sports attorney Phil Hochberg worked as the Redskins stadium announcer for 38 years. He can wow you with little-known facts about Washington's team. Hail to the Redskins, the song. The original lyrics were, fight for old Dixie, and then it was changed to fight for old D.C. It was a fitting theme for the franchise Marshall showcased on television all over the South. For him, not hiring black players was just good business. From an economic standpoint, he chose not to, to do it. But in 1961, while the Redskins were moving to the new stadium, they were also on a collision course with history. It was federal money involved, it was federal land involved. Stuart Udall, who was the Secretary of the Interior in the Kennedy administration, was determined that if the Redskins were going to use D.C. Stadium, the Redskins would be an integrated team. He let George Marshall know, in no uncertain terms, you're not going to have a place to play in the District of Columbia unless you get with the times. Reluctantly, Marshall gave in, and the Redskins team of 1961 was the last of the all-white rosters. When the Redskins hit the turf in 1962, there were four new black team members. Sports was ahead of the rest of the nation. If you can perform on the field or on the court or on the ice, you're going to be accepted. 
Uh, and, and so sports really has moved the American dream along. The 60s marked a phase so that people consider it the end to formal Jim Crow, but it has not. He is now James Crow Esquire. He is uh, a suit and tie, and he's working his tablet day and night because racial discrimination still exists in the United States. Up next, we look at the legacy of segregation and Jim Crow. Race still matters, but I understand how Americans, black, whites, and others wish that this was something that we had dealt with, but it's not like that. The reality is that race does matter. If you look in our prisons, you can blame the people or you can blame the society. The reality is, is that there's a pattern there. You can look at the poverty roster in our nation and shows you race matters. Look at the life expectancy of different groups. Look at the infant mortality rate of different groups. If you look at the social goodies, who has the power, the prestige, and the property in our country, and you can see that race still matters. It's so deeply ingrained, uh, the legacy of Jim Crow, in our culture, that it's gonna take many years, and quite frankly, mature hard work to move forward. Here in Alexandria's African American Heritage Park, you can take some time to reflect on black history and its lessons. We hope our show has given you some new perspectives about America's racial past and deeper thoughts about what remains to be done. I'm Robin Hamilton. Thanks for watching. <laughs>